Well, a very warm welcome to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Felicia Wong, Head of Conferences and Equipping at CMF UK. And I'm also a family practitioner um, in London. Today, we are privileged to have Dr. Emile Shahade speaking on Attitudes to Women, Christianity versus Islam. Dr. Shahade will speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll have a time of Q&A. Dr. Shahade was born and brought up in Israel, educated as a GP um, in the UK, and he also has a PhD in Islamic studies and now mainly focuses his time writing and speaking on the subject of Islam and evangelizing Muslims. Dr. Shahade supports evangelistic work amongst Muslims in North Africa and Nigeria. So a very war warm welcome to you, um, Dr. Shahade, over to you. Thank you, Felicia. It's a pleasure to work with you again. Thank you, Josh. And thank you to all who have joined us. Um, it's always a pleasure to serve God and have fellowship with uh, fellow colleagues. Uh, the subject, I think, is very important because half the world population is made up of women. And all of us have been born of a woman. And I was saying to Felicia earlier on, it is no secret, I tell my brothers, I love them, but I adore my sisters. Um, God's amazing creation, mothers, um, are wonderful human beings, key, key, key to our existence and uh, emotional and mental health. Um, so it's an important subject, and uh, there's a vast difference in attitude to women between Islam and Christianity. I say Islam and Christianity because Muslims are individuals. Not all of them will follow the teachings of Islam. At the beginning, I want to introduce you to uh, three names, um, testimonies who um, have actually shared their experiences with respect to women. So I, I've also shown a picture of uh, Anahita Parsan's uh, testimony. That is in print. You can order it on um, uh, Amazon. Um, and, and, and that's uh, a testimony which includes uh, a detailed uh, experience of a Muslim woman uh, before she became a Christian, of course. So let's start. Um, Islam uh, treats women uh, uh, as inferior beings. And the Quran is very specific. It says, but the men have a degree over them, them being women. Um, and then there's a hadith where uh, Muhammad, hadith, by the way, is the sayings of Muhammad. The Quran is the sayings of Allah, the God. The hadith is the sayings of Muhammad. Um, uh, and he says the majority of the dwellers of hellfire um, were you, women. And then uh, he said, you are ungrateful to your husbands. Of course, it can't be true. Um, some husbands will be ungrateful to their wives as well, and not all. Um, and then you are more deficient in intelligence and religion. So Muhammad think, has taught that women were in, uh, deficient in both intellect and religion. And he said, um, uh, is it not the evidence of two women equal to the witness of one man? So in court, if you want two witnesses, you either have two men or four women. So the witness of a woman is only worth half that of a man uh, because of the in intellig uh, deficiency in her intellect. Um, and isn't it true that a woman can neither pray nor fast during her menses. So the very thing that produces humankind, the uh, menstrual cycle that with uh, which none of us will be here, uh, has been seen by Muhammad. This gift of God uh, has been seen as a sign of inferiority. Um, and that is the essence of Muhammad's view of women. Uh, what does the New Testament teach? Uh, in, in a nutshell, the New Testament teaches that women are equal in value, of course, different in function. It's almost too obvious to state. Um, but uh, Paul, talking to the Galatians, says, so in Christ Jesus, 
you are all children of God through faith. Um, and and that is for both male and female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So whether you're a man or a woman, you are loved equally by God. You are esteemed equally by God. You are of the same value in the eyes of God. And God, uh, Jesus died for both of you, whether you're a male or a female. Then um, Islam uh, practices inequality. Um, so uh, in the Quran, it says, Allah instructs you concerning your children for the male, what is equal to the share of two females. So when you come to have your inheritance, uh, you get twice as much as your sister, if you're a Muslim. And that is fairly obvious. And that reflects the fact that women are of lesser value in the eyes of Allah than men are. In fact, if you think of heaven or paradise in Islam, is all geared to give pleasure to men. Men are going to have uh, so many virgins, uh, hundreds and thousands, and women have to make do with one husband. Uh, and that's not actually mentioned specifically. So there's huge inequality between men and women in Islam. Uh, the Quran also say, all oh, oh, you who believe, when you uh, when you take a loan one from another for a term, reduce the transaction to writing and procure, procure two witnesses from among you, your men. And if two men be not available, then one man and two women, because a woman is only worth half of a man's uh, testimony. Um, and again, that's in the Quran. Then we come to polygamy, uh, the fact that uh, uh, men can have more than one wife. That is in addition to sex slaves. Muhammad himself had up to 13 wives. Uh, so he exceeded. There are always exceptions for Muhammad. A Muslim can have up to four, but Muhammad had 13 plus, um, I'm not sure how many tens or hundreds of slave women. But the Quran itself says, if you fear that you shall not be able to deal justly with the orphans, that's orphan females, marry women of your choice, two or three or four. So you can have up to four, depending on how much you can afford. So in the Quran, men can have four women, wives. But women don't have that privilege. Women can only have one husband whom they must share with other women. Now, uh, in uh, the Bible, Paul writing to Timothy talks about overseers, talks about deacons, and talks about elders. And they all must be husbands of one wife. They are male. Yes, Christianity, and this may be controversial for some Christians, in the New Testament, leadership is in the hands of men. Uh, you can argue with Paul. Not my invention. But the point is not this. The point is that there must be husband to one wife. And that is a stark difference uh, with uh, Islam. In Islam, you can have four wives if, if you're a man. In Christianity, one wife. A man's in, in, in uh, Sahih Bukhari, which is a hadith saying by Muhammad, a man whose brother or friend desires one of his wives, may divorce his wife so his friend can marry her. And the word marry in Arabic is, uh, is uh, synonymous with to have sex. Nikah, meaning marriage or sexual intercourse. So, uh, and the application of this is often that if your brother is uh, visiting you and he hasn't had sex for a while, you can give him one of your wives. Um, so uh, we also come to the marriage of enjoyment, muta, um, which Muawiyah, the fifth caliph, practiced. Um, in other words, if you want to marry a woman for one day or two days or 60 days, there's a price as long as it is sanctioned by a Muslim religious leader and there's a price to pay. So it's really um, similar to prostitution, except it's religious, uh, you know, it's spiritualized. 
And often uh, poor women, particularly in Iraq amongst the Shia, resort to that. They're divorced, there's nobody looking after them, they have no income, and they offer themselves for marriage of enjoyment. Muhammad also said that woman has two things to cover her, the grave and marriage. In other words, uh, marriage is a way of covering a woman's shame. Um, and then he was asked, which of them is better? And he said, the grave. Of course, a grave is better because what woman would want to be worth half a man uh, only as a witness be worth half a man, only have a man's uh, half of man's uh, witness and there's more to come. Uh, what woman would want to simply be a sexual object for the enjoyment of men? For many women, the grave is better. And if I refer you back to uh, Anahita Pasa and read her testimony, you will see how she would, how she desired death um, as a Muslim woman. As we said, in Islam, women are really sex objects. And uh, please notice, I have so far uh, quoted mainly the Quran and then sometimes the Hadith. So the Quran is the highest authority in Islam, followed by Hadith. And for some Muslims, Hadith is of a higher authority than the Quran. But that's another subject. Um, so the Quran says uh, categorically, your wives are a place of sowing of seed, tilth, for you. It's quite picturesque. Uh, and so you plow them. I know some of you will feel this is disgusting and I apologize. Um, how you wish uh, and put forth uh, for yourself. So first of all, women are objectified uh, uh, and they have no will of their own. It is the husband's or the man's wish that matters. Uh, so the man can do what he pleases with a woman whenever he pleases. And in another hadith, it says, approach your till when or how you will. Women have no right to say no, or darling, not tonight. They have no right at all. And if a man invites his wife to sleep with him and she refuses to come to him, then the angels send their case curses on her till morning. Can you imagine? That's a hadith repeated in the most authoritative hadith in Islam, Sahih Bukhari. Sahih meaning correct. That is the highest grade of Muhammad's saying. So the, the, the angels in heaven have no other business than to curse this poor woman who for some reason isn't inclined to have sex with her husband. That is quite categorical. Please compare it with the Christian uh, ideal. The New Testament says the husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife. There's a sexual duty, let's not be shy about it. And likewise, the wife to her husband. Can you imagine the equality? The man has a duty towards his wife and the wife has a duty towards her husband. It's not just one way. The, the wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. Most Muslims would say, amen, wonderful, hooray. But bad news for Muslim men, in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Isn't our God wonderful, a God of equality? Do not deprive each other, except perhaps by mutual consent. That is the operative expression, mutual consent. No angels in heaven in heaven cursing you, women, if you say no. You have intercourse with your husband by mutual consent. Amen? That's wonderful. Praise God. And this is a point of contrast for women. This is a point where a lot of Muslim women are shocked when they see that Christianity, which in their mind is rubbish, it is so distorted, Muslims are brought up with a distorted picture of Christianity, that Christianity promotes adultery, um, uh, you know, disbelief in God, and so on. But when they hear this, they are shocked. And it's important for us to be equipped with these facts. Share it with your Muslim friends, particularly with women, and see their reactions. Share it preferably 
We're not interested in shaming Muslims. That's not the aim. We are interested in saving souls. We are interested in bringing people into the kingdom of God from darkness into light. That is our aim. I'm not interested in arguments. I don't want to show uh, Muslims that their religion is rubbish and mine is amazing. I want to show them that our God is a much better God. He's a much more loving God, much fairer God, and he is much more beautiful. So uh, learn this. The slides will be sent to you so you have all the references. Then in Islam, women carry right-hand possessions. You could be a princess one day or a queen. Then Muhammad goes into battle against your people. You are captured. You become a slave, a right-hand possession. And this Muslim can do what they like with you, including have sex with you. They can sell you a slave. So, um, so, so Muhammad, first of all, said that married women were forbidden for Muslims. Uh, except those who are right-hand possessions. So a married woman who is taken in, uh, um, into captivity, a Muslim man or jihadi can have sex with her. Uh, I've shown you the Quranic reference. Uh, it's also repeated in Sahih Bukhari. This is one of the highest grades, most reliable sources of Muhammad saying. Uh, uh, Muhammad said, uh, they came to him, his um, uh, 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 men. O Allah's apostle, we get female captives as our share of the booty, and we are interested in their prices. What is your opinion about coitus interruptus? What they used to say, okay, we can't sleep with them because they may be uh, pregnant or they may be married. So without being too um, uh, explicit, uh, they used to practice coitus interruptus. Um, but Muhammad said to them, do you really do that? He said, it's not necessary because after all, no human being is born except by God's will. So you don't worry about coitus interruptus. Don't practice that. Just go the whole hog. And if a child is born, that is because Allah wanted this child to be born. The fact that the poor woman had no say in it didn't seem to matter. Um, these are right-hand possessions and Muhammad had Quite a few of them. Then we come to the striking verse, this famous or infamous verse, Quran 434, according to which Allah has allowed men, Muslim men, to hit, to strike their women. And the verse has been translated into English uh, in so many different ways just to obfuscate, to blunt the obvious meaning that a Muslim man may strike his wife. Uh, first of all, it says men are in charge of women. So there's immediate superiority. Men are here, women are down here. But Allah get over the other and what they spend. So men spend money on women as if they were hired hands. Um, the fact that women cook and clean and that has no value. So righteous women are devoutly obedient. First of all, you must obey and it's not the same uh, word as uh, in the New Testament. We'll, we'll come to that. They are devoutly obedient, guarding uh, in their husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. That is their sexual parts, basically. But those wives from whom you fear arrogance. So a Muslim man simply needs to fear, to feel paranoid, paranoid that his wife is interested in another man. And that triggers three things. First of all, counsel them, advise them. Say, don't you dare think about it. If, they, if that doesn't work and you still suspect that they want to sleep with another man, forsake them in bed, don't sleep with them. And finally, if you still fear the disobedience or infidelity, strike them, strike them. The Arabic word is udrubuhunna. Which is no, no, no two ways about it. It means strike them. In fact, it comes from the verb daraba, which has entered the English language. If you watch football, the losing team is said to have received quite a drubbing from the winning team. And that comes from the Arabic. They were beaten, badly beaten. Uh, Muslims try to say, oh, this word is also used to mean to abandon. 
But it's not the word daraba, it is daraba al arda. He beat the earth. And that's similar to the American expression, beat it, you know, go away, beat it. Um, so the Quran doesn't say uh, strike the earth, it says strike them, women, in the fe feminine, or dubuhunna. So there's no getting away from the fact that Islam allows Muslim men to strike the women just if they suspect that these women may be interested in another man. And um, that you will not find in Christianity. In fact, um, uh, you will find that Muhammad struck his favorite wife uh, in the Hadith. Uh, he said, uh, uh, once uh, Aisha, his favorite wife, followed him at night, she was interested in seeing where he was going at night. So he, he uh, noticed her and, and he had words with her. He said, you were the black shape that I saw in front of me? I said, yes. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. That's what Aisha said in um, one of the hadiths, one of the sayings of Muhammad. The verb used in Arabic, lahadani, he struck me, has only one meaning. And I've looked up the meaning in one of the most recognized, uh, most authoritative Arabic dictionaries called the Comprehensive Meanings Dictionary. It says, uh, lahada means to push strongly in order to humiliate. You push someone against the chest here to show them that they are inferior to you. So Muhammad actually caused pain and told his favorite wife that she was inferior. We know that because she's female. Now we come to the Christian um, side. Biblical submission is paired with sacrificial love. Yes, women in Christianity in the New Testament must submit themselves to their husbands. Uh, the New Testament says in Ephesians 5, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So that's men submit to women and women submit uh, to men. That's a, a general term, uh, as we said, in, in, in the sexual sense, that is true. But it also says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Uh, and, and the balance is... Uh, the, the, uh, out of reverence for Christ because so also wives should submit themselves to their husband as the church submits to Christ that's the example but it doesn't stop there there's a powerful caveat in other words men if you expect your wives to submit to you you better do your part and the part is this husbands love your wives don't just love them love them with such intensity just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husband, if you're not willing to love your wife as Christ loved the church and was willing to die and die for her, don't expect submission. But husbands, if you love your wives with that intensity and faithfulness, women will gladly submit because what is to fear? The love of Christ is so powerful, so pure, and if you pursue that love, uh, taking Christ as your example, then your wife is more likely to submit to you. But that is the Christian view. That's my understanding of the Christian view. I understand some may disagree with me. We come now to divorce. The Quran treats divorce as something permitted but not laudable. Okay, so officially the Quran recommends that divorce should be avoided. But if you want to divorce, you're allowed to divorce. Uh, and I've given you a, a, a reference. Uh, Allah loves no permissible thing like marriage. And Allah hates no permissible thing like divorce. There's a tragedy in Islam, uh, a, a crime committed against divorced women. So a, a man who wants to divorce his wife, all he has to do is say divorce three times. He would say them all in one sentence, or he would say divorce once today and then once tomorrow. And then once the day after, that's three. So after the third, she is divorced from him. And if he regrets it and wants to have it back, he has to go to a muhallil, someone who makes it halal, for him to go back to his wife. And that muhallil has to have married his ex-wife, the divorced man's ex-wife, slept with her, and then release her to the ex-husband. The woman has no say in this matter. She's divorced without uh, uh, opinion. 
she is returned to her husband without her uh, opinion. Um, and, and that is quite disgusting to be uh, frank. Now, not all Muslims believe this or practice it, but it is an official teaching of Islam. A divorce may be retracted twice. So if you say it in the Quran, it says, if you say it twice, you can retract it. But the husband must retain his wife with honor or separate from her with grace. But if you say it three times, then the divorce is binding. So uh, in... Uh, Another hadith by a Tirmidhi, it is quite explicit. If somebody was to issue three, that's a man, to issue three divorces, whether they are in various sittings or one single sitting, in all cases, three divorces take place. So whether they be issued in one phrase or three separate words, they are both considered as three issuances of divorce. This makes the wife unlawful for the husband, as we said earlier. If you go to the New Testament, Jesus said, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality makes her the victim of adultery. Quite clear. Uh, in the life of Muhammad, we see that women were objectified. So he, one of his wives was called Sauda bint uh, Zama. She was older. In fact, he only had one young uh, wife called Aisha. The rest of them were older than Aisha. So being of old age, the word was out that he wasn't interested in her anymore. Uh, but she didn't want the shame of being divorced. So whereas Muhammad slept with a wife, uh, they, they were on a rota. Uh, to avoid being divorced, Sauda had to offer her night to Muhammad's favorite wife, Aisha. He was only, she was only 18 when Muhammad died. Uh, and Muhammad didn't uh, say, oh no, darling, it's not necessary. But he accepted the offer, implying he would have divorced her for being too old, which is shameful. But there's nothing in Christianity allowing a man to divorce his wife because she's too old. Uh, come to stoning. Uh, the Quran, uh, original Quran, approved of stoning of uh, adulteresses, particularly, and that verse disappeared because, according to Aisha, uh, when Muhammad died, uh, Aisha had hidden that piece of paper under her pillow, and somehow a sheep or a goat or a chicken found it and ate it, so it disappeared. But it was in the original Quran that you can stone someone caught in adultery. And there's a hadith that corroborates that stoning adulterers was approved. Comparing that with Jesus' attitude, when Jesus uh, was brought a woman who was caught in adultery, uh, Jesus uh, actually shot them up. He said, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Jesus was challenging these, usually men, wanting to stone a woman who was apparently caught in adultery. And it says, at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. Jesus is saying, we're all sinners, whether you're an adulterer or a liar or a um, hater, you are a sinner. And Jesus turned to the poor woman and said, where are they? Where are they? And she said, uh, um, who condemned you? Uh, and she said, uh, no one, sir. And Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus did not condemn the adulteress. He asked her to repent. Go now and leave your life of sin. That's quite a sharp contrast between Muhammad, who practiced and recommended stoning adulterers, Jesus, who actually said it's another sin and no one has the right to judge another sinner, only God is judge. Jesus gave her compassion, showed her compassion and gave her another chance. But he, in all this, we see that Islam is misogynistic. 
it actually treats women as inferior. And there are many ramifications of this. I'm going to refer to one of them now. And, and that is um, the fact that in many Muslim societies, a man neither has to pay for his wife's medical treatment nor for her funeral expenses. She's supposed to pay for them herself. And that is official in the Sharia or Fiqh. Uh, I must say something here. Although the Quran and the Hadith are the source of Muslim uh, theological authority, most Muslims consult uh, their imams who will consult what is called Fiqh. And Fiqh is the summary of what the Quran, the Hadith, and the Seerah, that is the life of Muhammad, taught. But it's open to interpretation. So there are at least four schools of Fiqh uh, or jurisprudence. And I'm quoting two of them, Shafi'i and Hanafi. And they say categorically that the um, uh, that the medical expense of the wife's treatment, visiting, uh, visiting a doctor, buying medicine, and so on, are not obligatory for the husband, even if he has the financial means. And that's repeated in other books of fiqh. I think that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. That's wonderful, um, Dr. Shahade. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, I um, We've got now some time for Q&A, and um, we thank you for that. Um, I'm sure that many, uh, if not all of those who are listening, friends who are listening all around the world, um, will be very shocked um, and very emotionally um, hurt and in pain from some of the things that you've told us today, um, mm. even for some who perhaps come from those kind of um, Muslim communities uh, or, or who have um, uh, sort of like um, dealings with Muslim communities, probably didn't realize the extent to which um, Islam uh, saw sees women as sex objects or the objectification of women. So thank you for explaining that to us. So we do have quite a few questions from our listeners who want to obviously hear a bit more um, and to, to kind of see, well, what, how does that work out in practice? And how can we use that, as you say, um, to show that our God is a great God, that he's a good, loving, fair God. Uh, he's the only God and the only savior. So um, a few questions just to put to you. Um, let me just get them up first. Um, so I've got someone asking, that um, and this I think we will know we will come across as doctors and dentists. Um, this person says I have had several. Uh, this this female um, sister says I have had several Muslim male patients who have sexual problems and they say that their wives are complaining and therefore they ask for help. Is there an expectation on Muslim men to excel sexually? Can women in Islam demand sexual activity of their husband? And then she asks, is there something I should be aware of when Muslim and men ask for help when it comes to sexual activity? Sometimes I'm afraid that my help will lead to negative experiences for their wives who maybe don't want to go down that route. Um, yeah, what would you say to that, Dr. Shahada? That's several questions in one. I would yeah. say um, uh, I'm not aware that Muslim women can't uh, demand. Um, but not in the same way that the um, you know angels of heaven won't uh, be cursing a man if he says no, mm. and uh, usually they don't say no. But anyway, <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah. I, I think when I, when I see a Muslim man uh, as a doctor who wants help, I I can't afford to think in those terms because we are there as doctors, yes. and I know what the man might be doing. I know how he might be treating his wife because I know what the official teaching of Islam is, but I can't judge in one case what he is doing for his wife. He may yes. be a very good man. So I think yeah. we need to approach it with an open mind. And uh, really uh, your options as a doctor, whether you're a Christian or not, mm. are, are limited. You just mm. have to treat him as any doctor treats him, but you can pray. I believe in the power of prayer because ultimately uh, of studied something like 6,000 Muslim testimonies to see what works, what, why these people become Christian. And I was struck with one answer. And he mm. said, sir, it's ultimately the work of the Holy Spirit. And, and I often do that. You know, I pray when I'm dealing with a Muslim. I pray mm. in my heart, Lord, touch their heart. 
mm. uh, you know, m maybe through my caring attitude, just touch their heart, make them go out and ask. Uh, yeah. And I make it known because of my color and complexion, they assume I'm a Muslim or Pakistani or, and I say, actually, I'm a Christian and my father was a vicar, but I have a lot of Muslim friends. So, so they know. Yes. Uh, yes. I, I think, I, I, I don't think you can go beyond that. Uh, that's really helpful Dr Shahida and as a, as a fellow general practitioner I would agree that we see the patient and we treat the patient in front of us and yeah. but we have a greater power than that which is the power of the Holy Spirit and we can pray Amen. yeah thank you for that and then I thank have you. someone else who's asked um how can we reach those women who have experienced all of this in Islam um and this friend goes to say that sometimes, of course, the way that Jesus does treat women, which is a, a completely a, a wonderful and such a, a um, yeah, such a, a very personal way, often doesn't happen. Like we don't see that necessarily in Christianity. I think it was just more of a comment. But how can we reach those women who have experienced all of this in Islam? Well, again, uh, through research, I've found out that most converts from Islam to Christianity convert through personal contact. So we convert them by being a fellow human being, a good neighbor, mm -hmm. engage in conversation, ideally a woman to woman. Mm -hmm. uh, in the context of a church, you can have a woman's evening, a woman's event, where you talk about womanly things, invite yes. them. Yes. And through interaction with you, through your grace, through your, the grace of God in you, through your loving kindness, which comes from God, they'll begin to ask. And they are curious, you know, they they because they all have heard things about you. And they'll be shocked when they see that you're not as mm. they were taught you were. Mm. Um so that that's one way. Uh so I think I think pray for opportunities to talk. You can yeah. do it on the bus or in the street. Yeah. You know, if you see somebody, a woman struggling, carrying a baby and all her shopping, offer a hand, start a conversation. Yeah. And see what happens. Yeah. That's a wonderful reminder. I think quite often in our very individualistic societies, and I know not not yeah. not all societies are like that, but it can be very much you just don't even look up. But actually, there is there are great opportunities around us if we look yes. and pray for them. Thank yes. you for that. Um, someone said here, thank you for your overview for the difference in the status of women between Christianity and Islam, which will have been shocking to quite a few of us, as I mentioned. Um, I am thinking of my, my many valued female medical colleagues from a Muslim background and wonder how their culture allowed them to achieve their professional status and responsibility, how that's compatible with the low view of women in the Quran. How does that kind of yes. square it? Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, one of the main qualities of Islam is it's self-contradictory. I mean, the Quran contradicts, it contradicts itself in about 500 places. So um, Quran is full of contradictions. If you see that as one of them, why are you surprised? Uh, the other thing is, not all Muslim societies, not all, um, you know, um, uh, uh, countries, Muslim countries, prevent the um, uh, professional pursuit of women. So, um, yes, it, it it happens. That That is true. That's why I said we need to distinguish between Islam and Muslims. Uh so, uh, yes, it, it doesn't stand to reason, but that's Islam. Islam doesn't actually stand the test of logic. Mm -hmm. uh, um, th thank you for, because that also helps us when people ask us those questions, etc. you know, to be able, it's yeah. part of the apologetics, isn't it? Um, yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. By the way, for sending in your questions, this is a really great chance for us to hear from um, Dr. Shaheda, who's obviously done a lot of research and knows this well. Someone has mentioned, um, please, could I ask about what Islam teaches about acceptable disciplinary practices for their children? Uh, so this person works as a pediatrician in child protection and would appreciate being better informed. Can you tell us anything about that in terms of discipline towards children? Is there anything in that in the in Quran or in the writings of Muhammad? Uh, I don't know. That is the quick answer, the honest answer. Yeah. But uh, having lived in the Middle East, and uh, uh, they're quite severe. Yeah, they're so quite severe. They're quite so They're punished children without mercy. Yeah. I'm generalizing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. you know, it's nothing for. I, I mean, I was brought up. I was never touched. I was never punished. 
you know, mm. physically by mm. my parents. We mm. were taught to interpret the look or the sound of our parents' voice. Mm. Uh, my brother and I have treated my ch our children exactly in the same way. Um, mm. But, you know, you see yeah. Muslims, when they strike, they strike without mercy. Uh, yeah. You know, it's quite severe. But again, that's a generalization. People are individuals. But mm. it, Islam has a harsh tone. Allah is harsh. Mm. They often repeat that Allah is merciful and compassionate. But all his judgments are harsh. All his standards are harsh. Fasting for a month is harsh. You know, uh, so it, it, Islam is self-contradictory. So God is merciful, but he's very harsh. Mm. And, and that harshness appears in everything. In family, mm. you know, husband, wife relationships and child and son if you look i mean if, if a christian i come from israel from a small christian arab community if a christian lady marries a muslim her family may feel sad but they won't disown her mm. they won't disown her but if a muslim marries uh, uh you know a muslim woman marries a christian they will disown her they'll try and kill her yeah, yeah? yeah. um so harsh harshness permeates all all Muslim life, I emphasize Muslims are individuals, but there is a tendency. Thank you. Thank you for that. That's All those are really good reminders of seeing yeah. the person in front of us and not generalizing, just yes. like we don't, you know, we, we have a problem with people generalizing Christianity because that's what they see yes. as well. Thank yes. you. Um, I have another question here. Um, my Muslim friends seem to be well educated. Um, uh, from my, they seem to be well educated on the points of difference and critiques of Christianity, but Christians, and I would echo this as well, seem largely ignorant of Islam. Do we need to be better informed about Islam and therefore better able, equipped to be able to speak into it? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. What can I say? I retired nine years ago because of this. I felt the calling uh, right. because of my background and interest. Um, to just contribute to enlightening the church about true Islam, not just the church, our societies. Yeah, uh, so, yeah. you know, there are people converting to Islam because they grow up in a Muslim, in a Christian country, but they have no knowledge of true Christianity. And Islam is an evangelistic religion. They want the whole world to convert. Yeah. And they put us to shame. We're not as keen on seeing them come to Jesus. Mm. And yes, we need to be better informed. And mm. anyone who wants help, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to send you books, talk, anything. But yes, absolutely, we need to be far better informed. Um, yes, there's that was point six. Yeah. Oh, sorry, there's I was one... just going to say that that's, um, that was my next oh. question, which you kind of said you, you had resources, is that how would we even begin? You know, because sometimes it's like with most things, one can feel overwhelmed with, wow, how do I even begin? There was just so much. So I think small steps to help people so if you could just perhaps put some things later on in the uh, chat or maybe actually you'll I think I think we'll be having resources anyway that will be linked to the show notes of this webinar that you can give to Josh and then we'll put them out so then these people will know actually this is how we even begin to be better informed that would be really helpful written, Thank you. yeah I will send you a book which uh, in pdf which covers everything and, and you can look up sections yeah Okay. That sounds great. This is quite a medical question, but I think probably, you know, many of us might come across this and, and we do need to understand this. This is about F FGM, so female genital mutilation. Yeah. Um, and um, so our, our brother says, um, thank you for a superb and objective presentation. Um, he's been told um, by an imam about um, sexual pleasure belongs 100% to the man and therefore private parts of the female must be removed to prevent them obtaining the pleasure that rightly belongs to the man. Um, how, how would we answer something like that? How, how would we speak to something like that? Well, I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's in tandem with the rest of the tenure of Islam. It's, it's a male religion. Everything is centered around man's sexual pleasure. Um, but Muhammad himself approved of female genital mutilation, FGN, but he said, don't cut too much. But how do you interpret don't cut too much? <laughs> you either cut or you don't. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the thing is cruel, painful. And again, it just reflects the inferiority of women that they have to go through it. Mm -hmm. um, 
Uh, sorry, I, have I answered that or? Um, I just wanted to, uh, to say a little bit about, you know, thank you for that. Um, mm. Obviously, um, in the UK, that is illegal. Um, and um, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think that is the case, obviously, throughout all um, all countries and throughout the world. No. But how would we as um, Christian practitioners, when we come across that, be able to even um, perhaps speak into that, help either understanding or yes, how, how would we manage that situation where it's not illegal? Well, I, I think uh, you have to act as a doctor. In the UK, we have to inform it's a safeguarding issue. Yes. So, so there's a pathway to follow. Uh, but then as a human being and as a Christian, your attitude matters. You would ask questions, uh, you know, how how was this done? Were you happy with it? Are you happy with it? And you may encounter all sorts of attitudes. Out of fear, they may say yes. But mm -hmm. if you give them a chance to be themselves, they might say no. Uh, and you, you could, you know, you have to be careful, but you could say, oh, you know, I... I sympathize with you because in my religion it's not it's not allowed, it's not practiced, it's not recommended. Uh you could introduce the idea. Yeah. It's another opportunity uh, to care and to walk alongside yes. and have opportunities yes. to come our way. Thank you for yes. that. Yeah. Um question that also I had is that um on the whole, do you from your from your dealings and from your research and from um, Muslims whom you know, and of course, like you say, everyone's different. Are Muslim women generally aware that this is Islam's attitude towards women? Is that quite way, widespread and known? The simple answer is no. Because most Muslims can't read the Quran um, because it's in Arabic. Uh, so that, that excludes maybe 80% of Muslims. And if they can read it, they can't understand it. And Muslim women who speak Arabic, most of them are not educated. So very few people can read the Quran. Uh, as for the Hadith, there's hundreds of volumes to read. Okay. I mean, so they resort to the Imams. So most Muslims know what they know through their Imams and mothers, and you know. Um, and often uh, Muslim clergy present a, a manicured picture of Islam to Muslims. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and and t take the striking verse. They will say to you, oh no, what, what the Quran meant is strike them gently with a smooth toothbrush. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't say so in, in the Quran, but so they try and get around it okay. uh, with yeah. a smooth, ju just a gentle brush. That's mm. what it means. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and a lot of converts uh, are shocked when they discover the truth, that they've been lied to all their lives. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay. yeah. Most of them I are mean, not aware of it. Yeah. Otherwise, there would be a lot more sort of like, at least awareness out there and people talking about Oh, yes. About. Yeah. yeah. Um, which, if I may add, which, if mm -hmm. I may add, uh, highlights the need for polemics pointing out what is wrong in Islam. God yeah. has used it. Paul did it. Jesus did it. Uh, yeah. Brother J. Smith does it uh, full yeah. time. Uh, it's how we do it. We do it gently, sensitively, comparatively. Present, yes. as we did now, we compared what Islam teaches with the Christian alternative. Mm. And let, let, leave it with them, pray for them. Mm. Thank you. Um, I have a question here, just so that we can bring back, obviously, to the Bible um, and some comparisons. So someone asked here, thank you so much. Can you say a few words um, about Chris the Christ Christian view of divorce and polygamy in the Old Testament? Yeah, I'm going to say I'm going to uh, say a few uh, a few words, few words. which shut which the conversation down. Basically, we are living in the New Testament. OK. So we, we, uh, uh, Jesus is our example. The apostles are our examples. Uh, uh, King David isn't my example. And what God has permitted is not the same as what God has uh, ordered. Okay, God has permitted polygamy in the Old Testament. It doesn't mean that's what He wants us to practice. That's a logical problem. You know, just to say because we believe in the Old Testament doesn't mean we approve of everything written there. So the, the Old Testament, which is referred to as the law, uh, was the background 
for our present. We're living in the age of grace. So, um, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people who call themselves Christians believe in polygamy. Uh, I, I know people quite close to me who, if it, if it weren't for societal embarrassment, he would marry more than one wife. But I think that's a wrong view because mm -hmm. the New Testament tells us one wife. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. That's really clear from Jesus. Mm -hmm. That was a good few words and very, very helpful. Thank you very much. One last word from you, Dr. Shaheda, before we kind of close, because sadly we haven't got time to uh, answer all those lovely questions, but clearly there's a lot of interest and we do thank you for being mm. able to open this up to us. One last question sure. then. Um, so if we were to say, um, okay, so we've all heard about this. We really want to be better equipped that we can have these conversations and you know show the awareness, the polemics, as you say. Where should we start? You mean How to equip start? yourself with knowledge? I'll send you an essay with loads of references. Brilliant. Take it at your own pace. Okay. Uh, do excellent. your own research. And uh, yeah. Okay, really. Yeah, that's really excellent. And just even the things you've said today, you know, we're interested in in saving souls, um, about who our God is, like you said, a God of compassion, not harshness, yes. all of those yeah. things. Just even from yeah. today, we can see how much, you know, we've been able to um, see that we can actually, the, uh, how much we can use those opportunities to show who yes. Jesus is, to show who our God is. So it is absolutely wonderful yeah. to be able to, and I've certainly learned a lot. So thank you so much for thank that. You. Um, you for and uh, like I said, sadly, we have to draw this to a close now, but thank you very much, Dr. Shaheda. Well, thank you everyone. Um, God bless you, you and may the joy of the Lord be your strength. Thank you, Dr. Shaheda. Thank you, Felicia. Bye-bye then.